makes noise. Take your seat quickly. Can somebody close the door? Okay. Shall we start? So uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Evan Andrei from Rutgers University. And uh, she will teach us about electronic properties of graphene and 2D materials. I don't remember how many lectures you have. Two or three? How many lectures? Four. Four. Oh, four. One hour. OK. Yes. OK. So this is the first of four. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm an experimentalist and uh, working on two-dimensional electronic properties primarily with various techniques, which you're going to get to hear about tomorrow. Uh, I will start today, the two lectures for today, with a general background, and I'll be there will be some equations and some theory uh, in a, that are presented in a way uh, that experimentalists like to think about. Now, I think that since the discovery of graphene in 2005, it, I think it is fair to say that it has revolutionized the way we think about materials. Uh, since the discovery in 2005, there have been dozens new materials isolated or synthesized that are really two-dimensional. What is special about these two-dimensional materials is first, uh, we find electronic properties, we find quasi-particles that have topological and transport properties that you cannot find in any other material or in particle physics, for example. So they have completely new properties. The second part is uh, because all the atoms are on the surface, none are hidden anywhere, uh, we can very easily manipulate their properties. So we can change, and this is, this, there's more and more of this coming every day, that we can change the electronic properties at will without using any chemistry. So for example, you can stretch a piece of uh, two-dimensional material like graphene or anything else. You can bend it, you can fold it, you can cut it. Every time you get new electronic properties. Now you can put it on different substrates. Now the latest that was announced this, at the March meeting this year is if you superpose two graphene layers, one on top of the other, and you put a twist between them, uh, you create something that's called Van Hoff singularities. They're special, and when the angle is very small, you get flat bands. You put your Fermi energy in the flat band, and lo and behold, you get a mod insulator. And if you cool it, you get a superconductor. This is absolutely unheard of. Just by twisting, you can induce superconductivity. And what's amazing about this is that the phase diagram of the superconductor and the mod insulator next to it resemble in many, many ways the phase diagram of high TC materials. You have an insulating uh, uh, piece, and on the two sides you have superconducting domes with a reasonably high superconducting transition, and this is something that everybody is getting excited about, and uh, I'm planning to tell you a little bit about this uh, tomorrow. Uh, if we, uh, okay, my pointer is not working, okay, uh, for some reason it's not working. Batteries is dead. Okay, uh, let me let me. 
OK, I have spare batteries. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this tomorrow. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the history of two-dimensional materials, talk about the electronic properties, the band structure um, of, uh, of graphene. So in the first lecture, we're going to uh, do electronic properties, band structure, uh, density of states. Uh, in the second part, we will talk about we're going to apply a magnetic field, and we're going to look at uh, Landau levels, the formation of Landau levels, and uh, quantum Hall effect, integer and fractional quantum Hall effect, how it is different in graphene than in other two-dimensional materials. Now let's see if now I can get it to work. Oops, it's working. OK, it's working. Uh, OK, so let's get started. Um, this is one of the very rare cases. Actually, I don't know of any other one where material was invented before it was discovered. Uh, so this was shortly after World War II. Uh, Russell War uh, Wallace, who was working for the Atomic Energy Commission in Canada, was asked, he was a young postdoc, was asked to calculate a band structure of graphite. The reason is people were very, after the atomic bomb, people were trying to use atomic energy for peaceful purposes for atomic reactors. And what they needed is a moderator. So the, uh, Wallace's bosses told him, calculate a band structure structure of graphite because that was a good candidate. And he worked and worked and worked and failed. He was not able to do this. So he said, OK, as we usually do, I can't solve graphite. Let me, do, let me solve a simpler problem. Let me take one layer of graphite, which we now call graphene, and let me solve the band structure of that. And there he succeeded. Uh, actually, it took uh, another decade, 12 years, for a team from Rutgers to calculate the band structure of graphite. <laughs> so this graphene or this layer was pretty much forgotten over the decades. Nobody thought about it. So every, every once in a while, a theorist will pull it out of the drawer, dust it off, and, and make a curious model out of it. So in 1943, Gordon Semenov proposed this as a condensed matter realization of three-dimensional anomalies. And in 87, Duncan Haldane proposed this as a model of a quantum Hall effect in, without a magnetic field. And of course, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this work, but nobody thought that this was at all anything that will ever be realized in the lab. Now, why is that? The reason is that, uh, that uh, sorry, okay, Merman, to, Merman and Wagner are to blame. I used to have a, their photo here, but I don't have it anymore. So in the 60s, uh, they wrote down a theory that says that continuous symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken at finite temperature in systems with sufficiently lo uh, long-range interactions if the dimension is smaller than two. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you're in two dimension or less, it's very easy for the system to deform in the third dimension, and you get fluctuations that destroy your, your short, your long-range order. So as a result, in two dimensional, we cannot have magnets, we cannot have superfluids, and we cannot have superconductors. In particular, we cannot have two-dimensional crystal because there's no long-range order. So, um, and here is, uh, here, here is an illustration of why that is. Uh, what I have here is 400 carbon atoms, uh, and they're throwing in, thrown into a, a, in a cubicle box, and they're uh, numerically heated up to 2,000 degrees Kelvin, and uh, let's watch what happens. So you see the atoms jiggling around. Every once in a while, they will grab a neighbor and, and form a chain. And if you wa watch long enough, they even form a ball, a buckyball, which is kind of stable. Uh, and this can go on forever. It can go on and on and on. And no matter how, you even may be able to do a nanotube. But no matter how long you wait, you will never get a two-dimensional surface because fluctuations out of, the, out of the plane are too cheap, and the fluctuations are going to destroy the long-range order. <clears throat> so uh, 
when in, uh, in 2004, uh, Geim and Novoselov from Manchester announced that they were able to isolate two-dimensional atomic crystal, people did not believe them. In fact, they were not able to publish their work because people said, you can't do that. You must be lying. You must be cheating. So they got very nervous. They invited everybody in the field to come to their lab to teach them how to do this. So they were able to isolate uh, graphene, niobium di graphene, niobium diselenide, uh, boron nitride, uh, et cetera, for about five different two-dimensional materials. So what was the trick? So they thought, OK, you cannot have long-range order in two dimensions. Can we cheat na nature? So you have layered materials like graphite or transitional metal dichalcogenides that have very strong in-plane bonds but very weak van der Waals bonds in the, in the third direction. So you get layers, and it's very easy to exfoliate them. So their idea was, OK, let's play like a conjurer trick. We pull one card out of the deck, and let's see what happens. So this is what they did. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you write with a pencil, we've been writing with pencils I think since the 16th century, when the graphite was first discovered and the pencil was first made. And every time you write, you bring pencil to paper, in the debris that is left behind, there will be graphene. And we've been making graphene for centuries, except nobody knew. And what's the reason that no nobody knew? The reason is that it's impossible to see a, a, a layer that is only one atom thick. There's just no contrast. You don't have the tools to see them. So, um, so this, this was, uh, was a well-kept secret for all this century until um, a guy named Nov Novoselos completely accidentally uh, uh, tripped over the following. They said, OK, we're going to take some scotch tape and just put it on, uh, on a substrate. And they had, it sitting in the lab, a very old uh, wafer, silicon uh, wafer with, covered with 300 nanometer of silicon dioxide. This used to be used in the 80s in the semiconductor industry. And the reason this is, has 300 nanometers of silicon dioxide uh, nowadays, this is totally obsolete. So they just had this lying on the shelf, and they put their, their, they, they put their graphite, their, they just wrote with a pencil, if you like, on top of it. Uh, now, the reason 300 nanometers is when you shine light of it uh, on, uh, on this wafer, you have a, def a reflection from the top layer and reflection from the interface with the silicon. And there is a destructive interference between the two rays at, at green light that makes it so that any piece of dust it will be appear very, it will, will be visible because you change the phase of, of, the, interfe the, of the interference. <clears throat> uh, and the reason they had to do it this way, because in those days you inspected the wafers uh, manually just by, by eye. Uh, OK, so there, is, there are these extension bands. This is wavelength versus thickness of this layer. And you see everywhere where you have dark, you're going to get, um, you're going to be able to visualize dust or anything else. So um, if you work at 500 nanometers wavelength, which is green light, where our eye is most sensitive, 300 nanometers is a sweet spot. So they had this, and they put the graphene on top, and this is what they saw. So with the 300 nanometer oxide, they immediately saw uh, this is single monolayer, bilayer, trilayer. You see the step in atomic force microscopy. If, if they had uh, 200 nanometers uh, of oxide and white light, they, wouldn't, they would have seen nothing. And uh, 300 nanometers of oxide and white light, it would have been much less of a contrast. So you see there was really serendipity at play here. Uh, so how do we make graphene in the lab today? Let's see if this works. Take a scotch tape and gently lay it down on a flat surface. Next, take clean metal tweezers and pick a thin graphite flake and then place this gently onto the scotch tape. Next, fold the scotch tape at the edge of the graphite flake. 
peel it off gently and do this step several times until you obtain a nearly transparent region on the scotch tape. After this, take a clean silicon wafer to transfer the scotch tape graphene onto the wafer. Use plastic tweezers and gently rub the area of the scotch tape where graphene may potentially be. Slowly peel off the scotch tape so as not to break any potential graphene sheets. Use an optical microscope to view and find graphene. Graphene appears as a purple spot on the screen. At the center of the screen is multi-layer graphene and at the right corner, lower right corner of the screen, is single layer graphene. Uh, so this is how we do it. Uh, nowadays there are techniques by, by chemical vapor deposition where you can grow huge areas, like a whole wall full of graphene, but those are not perfect. They have dislocations, they have grain boundaries. But this technique by exfoliation is where you get the best samples. And when you, when you want to learn about fundamental physics, this is the techniques that you use still today. <clears throat> Uh, and just a few properties of graphene. So you must have heard that it's, it's the strongest material known. How was this measured? This was the group, the Manchester group. They took uh, a sheet of graphene, uh, which was about uh, half a micron, uh, about actually five microns long. They loaded it with uh, copper nanoparticles. <laughs> and they measured how much it deflected at the end. So they found that it deflected by one nanometer. You immediately can f calculate that the Young's modulus is about two terapascals. Now, to give you an idea what this means, uh, if I had uh, a piece of paper here, um, and it was as large as this room, uh, if I put all of you on this piece of paper, if it were graphene, it will sag by about one centimeter. This is what to terapascal means. <clears throat> so co by comparison to other materials, here are all the materials that we know. Up here, uh, we have ceramics. Uh, steel is somewhere here, too. And if you put graphene on the same sheet, it's stronger than anything we know. So that is one of its unusual properties, remarkable properties. Uh, another is optical properties. So this is uh, um, an optical microscope where you're looking at the reflections through graphene. So this is no graphene. One monolayer graphene absorbs 2.3% of the light. Two monolayers double that. So in fact, because of the electronic properties that we're going to hear about, the amount, the, tr the transmission is one minus alpha. Alpha here is the QED fine structure constant. This is the only thing that enters into the physics of graphene and pi. So it's 97% for one layer. It's two alpha pi for two layers and so on and so forth. Uh, and actually, this is when it's a charge neutrality. When you gate graphene and you put in electrons or holes, uh, so you can actually change, for example, this is the gate voltage here, so this is charge neutrality. So the trans transmission is almost completely transparent. Uh, you put 50 or 30 volts on it, it becomes dark. So you can use that, for example, for screens and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Uh, one last property that I'm going to mention is uh, it has, uh, it's sensitive to single molecules. So for example, if you measure the, sh the change in the hole resistance uh, when you add um, sodium or, or ammonia or carbon monoxide, uh, every, every molecule that comes in gives you a step in the, in the resistance. So you can actually measure single molecule, very sensitive nose. <clears throat> Um, one other thing that, that is very important today is that it's completely impermeable. You can put a pressure gradient of one atmosphere on a layer of graphene, uh, of helium, for example, not a single helium atom will go through. 
perfectly permeable, even though it's one monolayer thick. So since uh, the discovery, there were many new two-dimensional materials discovered, uh, about 40 of them, uh, uh, transitional metal dichalcogenate, phosphorine family, uh, monocalcogenites here, uh, and so on and so forth, and they each have different properties, superconducting, insulating, um, semiconductor, and so on. And uh, what's even more, now it has become an industry, you can just stack them one on top of each other and you can put various properties so you can design your material basically without any chemistry. So these kinds of stacks, if you try to actually synthesize them chemically, many or most of them are not stable. Uh, but doing it this way, uh, these are, of course, they were probably metastable, but they're stable enough to make a device out of them and to examine their properties. Uh, so here, here is, for example, how we do them in our lab. You pick up a graphene piece with boronitride. You have a, a polymer here, which we call PDMS, uh, and you just press it onto a substrate. Um, and then you can put another boronitride uh, layer on top. And this is uh, what it looks like in an optical microscope. So this is uh, graphene, boronitride, uh, boronitride, graphene, and on top of that boronitride. It's the same kind of material that was used in order to discover the superconductivity and the twisted layers. And this is a TEM image, and you see how beautiful, perfect they are. The boronitride layers are here, graphene is here, and the, the top boronitride is on top. <clears throat> okay, so let's go, let's talk about carbon now. Uh, so carbon has uh, six valence electrons, has four valence electrons, six total electrons. Uh, and when it makes a chemical bond, there's two ways it can make a chemical bond. One is the sp3, where the, the four uh, valence electrons hybridize together, uh, and you form a, a symmetric structure, which is a tetrahedron. Uh, and this is, uh, gives rise to diamond, basically. It's a very strong insulator, um, uh, insulating material. Now, the other kind of bond that graphene can make, that carbon can make, is sp2, where we have, uh, we have three of the valence electrons hybridized into, and they use into these, to form these sigma bonds. These are flat bonds uh, separated 120 degrees from each other, and there's one pi orbital that's, that sticks out. This is the sp2 hybridization, and this gives rise to uh, graphite, which looks like this, and of course a single layer would be graphene. What is actually very interesting, I mean, when you, when you ask your girlfriend to marry you, uh, you, some people give her a diamond uh, because there's this myth that diamonds are forever. But in fact, diamond is a metastable phase of carbon. The stable phase of carbon is graphite. <laughs> okay, so if you look here, graphite, so this is pressure versus temperature. Um, so this is where room to ambient conditions are. The, the stable form is graphite. So don't tell it to your girlfriend. Eventually, the, the ring is going to turn into soot. But she can wait. That it's going to take a many, lot, many years. Uh, now, carbon is the only element on the periodic table that where sp2 is the ground state. All the other elements, uh, all the other elements in the fourth column, the stable a form is sp3. So people are trying very, very hard to make silicon look like graphene that's look, called silicine, germanine, but it's very hard because they don't want to do that. And the reason is carbon is, is because of the ratio of the size of the, of the, uh, of the orbits, because the, in, it, it's, it's only in the first uh, level that, that your valence electrons are, and their Coulomb energy is strongest, whereas in the, in the lower elements, silicon and, and, um, and uh, germanium, et cetera, the, the, nucle the atom is larger, the p orbitals are further out, and it pays, if you do the, the calculations, it really pays to be sp3. Only carbon has a ground state of sp2. 
So only carbon can create something like graphene, except if we try hard, as you will see later. Uh, okay, so sp2 carbon allotropes, there are several forms. Uh, so it's a very flexible kind of structure because it's two-dimensional. Uh, and the, it's bound in the third direction with another layer by very weak van der Waals forces. So the, uh, this is a zero-dimensional form. This is a bucket ball discovered in 1985. Actually, it was discovered by astronomers. Um, 1996 Nobel Prize. The second form is the carbon nanotube. This is the one-dimensional form discovered in 1991. No Nobel. And uh, uh, it's, uh, the reason there's no Nobel for this is because there are too many people fighting each other. And whenever, whenever that happens, there's no Nobel because they can't make up their minds. Uh, and the third one was two-dimensional uh, Nobel in 2010, and this is graphene. <coughs> and of course, three-dimensional is graphite. Uh, okay, now we're going to the next topic, which is the electronic properties. The, the band structure. Uh, now, I'm going to just do a quick reminder of tight binding because the tight binding gives a very, very good, uh, it's a very, very good approximation to the actual band structure of graphite, of graphene. Okay, so if you have a periodic potential, the, in red here we have the atomic orbitals which sit on the atoms, uh, and then uh, if you have the phi, phi's are the uh, eigenstates of the isolated atoms, and now if you have a little bit of overlap between the orbitals, you hum and if it's small enough, uh, your Hamiltonian is the original Hamiltonian plus a perturbation, you can do perturbation theory. So this is the new Hamiltonian with the new wave function, and we can just expand in this correction, delta u. <clears throat> so, so tight binding works very well when you have small overlaps. Uh, so, so the way this works is, okay, we, if we have a periodic structure, uh, and in order to have a periodic structure, you have to have a Bravais lattice. And this is a real kicker here, and as you will see in a moment. If you have a Bravais lattice, which means that you have a periodic structure, you can write a block function. Block function is a good solution for your Hamiltonian. So you write it down like this. It's a, it's a kind of a plane wave multiplied by the... Uh, something that is periodic, and this is the atomic wave function on each, of each one of the atoms. And then, okay, we have the, the block wave function, we plug it into the Hamiltonian, so these are the conditions that the wave function has to satisfy normalization, number one. Uh, it has to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, number two. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you just do some algebra and you find a solution. It's as simple as that although the algebra can be pretty involved, but there's only these two, these three steps. And then you write, you find a solution in terms of the transfer or hopping integral, which is, uh, these are nearest neighbor, the atomic orbital on atom J, uh, and the atomic uh, transfer integral between atomic and atom J, and the atomic orbital on I, which is nearby. And we call that Tij. And also in terms of the overlaps between adjacent wave functions. Um, and this is another way of writing the Hamiltonian with raising and lowering operator, but it's the same thing. But the reason I'm writing it like this is because it has explicitly here the, uh, the transfer integrals. So when you do a tight binding for very simple periodic metal, metal like gold or silver, uh, you usually get a very simple band structure that can be approximated by, it's, it's basically quadratic in the momentum. And if whenever your energy is quadratic in momentum, you completely say, okay, that must be momentum square. Whatever is the, the numerator here must be a mass. So we define an effective mass, which has absolutely nothing to do with the actual mass of the electron. It's just a way of saying that the energy is proportional to the square of the momentum. So we get something that typically looks like this. This is a parabola and a wave function. These are equi-energy uh, surfaces. Now, how is graphene different? Now, the graphene is different because it's a honeycomb lattice. It's not a Bravais lattice. 
the games that I've done here don't work for when you don't have a Brave lattice. So when you don't have a Brave lattice, you get all sorts, lots of, uh, um, lots of interference, and your band structure looks like a mess. It looks like this. And these are, these are the uh, 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 equi-energy planes. So you get a very unconventional di dispersion. By the way, this is exactly the dispersion that Wallace got, except that it was not in three dimensions. But this is his, his solution was absolutely correct, even in today's terms. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk you a little bit through how we get the solution, and I'm going to walk you through the quasi-particles that correspond to excite low energy excitation for graphene. And uh, you will see that they have weird and interesting properties, those graphene quasi-particles. OK, so we start. So th there's only three ingredients that go into the unusual band structure of graphene, really only three. The fact that it's two-dimensional, the fact that it's a, it's a honeycomb lattice, which means that it's non-brave, and the fact that we have identical units on the two sub-lattices. Now, what, I, what do I mean by two sub-lattices? Notice that. A, a, a Brave lattice is one is when you move, no matter where you move, on how many lattice spaces you move, your environment is exactly the same. But here you see immediately we have two groups. It's bipartite. We have two groups of atoms. I can color it red and green. Uh, the green atoms have a red neighbor down south. The red atoms have a green neighbor up north. So this is not a Brave lattice. So what this is, it's two interpenetrating triangular lattices, which are Brave. So what we have to do, are we have to write a, a wave function, two wave functions, one for the green atoms and one for the red atoms. And the total wave, wave function is going to be a linear combination of the two. Uh, so here are just some concepts to give you some idea. Don't get too uh, hung up on this. I'm defining here the lattice constant A. That, uh, uh, so that's the lattice constant for graphene is 2.46 ang angstroms. Uh, this is the first brillouin zone that looks like a, it's a hexagon. These are the reciprocal lattice vectors. And the special points in the brillouin zone, these are the K points that we're going to talk about a lot. Uh, and one k point is at 4 pi over 3a, this one. The m points in between the two here, and the gamma point is the center of the Brillouin zone. So we're going to mention these a few times. Uh, so, um, so because we have two wave functions, the wave function for the electrons in graphene is a linear combination of the two. So it can be written as a linear combination of the wave function on the a sub lattice and one on the b sub lattice. OK, so green sublattice, red sublattice, and you can write down the prefactor here. This looks exactly like a spinner. So the wave function looks like a spinner. It has two components, OK, because we have two different sublattices. Each component corresponds to the part of the wave function that it's on the green or on the red sublattice. So immediately you see we have a new degree of freedom. Uh, this is like, it, and it's, it resembles spin up and spin down for a spinner. Uh, but instead of acting on the spin, it acts, uh, we're going to be acting on the sublattice degree of freedom, which we call now pseudo spin. It's not a real spin, it's like a spin, we call it pseudo spin. Uh, <coughs> um, okay, so. Uh, I'm, I'm going through a little bit of the, of the derivations here because there's a few concepts that I want to bring home. So the Hamiltonian, of course, is a two by two Hamiltonian. And on the diagonal here, uh, we have uh, the self energies here on the A sub lattice, on the B sub lattice here. And the off diagonal here, we have the phase, which is basically the sums of the phases on the, th the nearest neighbors, e to the i, k, delta, J, some of all these, OK? So these are the things that go in. Now, for graphene, epsilon b and uh, the, oh, sorry. This should be epsilon a and epsilon b. Sorry, this shouldn't be a b, OK? Epsilon 
V and epsilon A are equal, and we call them epsilon zero. And this really simplifies the algebra enormously. And by the end of the day, we get an, a constitutive equation like this, where the energy uh, has two, where we have two solutions, which I'm going to draw in a moment. But notice that it depends on two things. One, it depends on the hopping integral, T. And two, it depends on this phase here. So it depends crucially on two things. The two most important things are A, the geometry, which comes in through F here, because it is triangular geometry, and B, it, it's T here, which is the hopping integral, okay? Now, uh, here is a, a note of caution. If uh, we have different species on the two sublattices, the solutions are extremely complicated, uh, and most importantly, you will not get, you will get a gap. At the, at the Fermi energy. You'll get a gap at charge neutral. It's going to be an insulator. So one example is, for example, boron nitride, where it's identical to graphene, except in, instead of having carbon everywhere, one sublattice has boron, the other sublattice has nitrogen. And that has a huge gap, has a six electron volt gap. It's one of the best insulator we know because, uh, this, because you avoid this crossing here, which you're going to see in a moment. So this is the solution. I'm writing down the solution. And it's really very simple algebra. I, I strongly recommend that you do this as a homework. Uh, and these are the two solutions. We have an antibonding and a bonding solution. These are for the plus and for the minus. Uh, and you see they cross here. This is what we call the Dirac points. They call, cross at these points. Now. Uh, if you look on the Brillouin zone, this is the K and K prime. So these are the two points. But of course, this is a, has to be a two-dimensional structure. So we have six of these K points. Um, so you see, we have six of these K points. This is what this three the three-dimensional image of the band structure looks like. But what we're going to be interested in is the low energy properties. So we zoom into. Uh, this point here, the, the crossing, what we call the Dirac point, and this is what it looks like. Now, we have six points here. I only draw two. Why do I only draw two? Why should I not draw all of them? It has to do with the fact that, that uh, all the other guys are connected to either K or K prime by a reciprocal lattice vector. So the physics is identical, OK? So only two matter, OK? All the other ones are going to just repeat the same physics because you can move from one to the other by adding a, re a reciprocal lattice vector, OK? Now, one very important thing you probably learned in your first course in condensed matter in, in solid state, that if you have bands that intersect, you, you have level repulsion. You open a gap. This is the natural thing that happens. So why isn't anybody asking me, how come this, this survives? Now, the reason it survives is that it's protected by three symmetries. You have to br the symmetries by which it is protected is, is time reversal, inversion, and C3, rotation by 120 degrees. So you have to break at least two of them to open a gap. Very, very difficult to gap out graphene, which is both a curse and a blessing, as you will see. OK, so those Dirac points are very, very stable. I mean, you can stretch the thing. You can bend the thing. They move around in k-space, but they don't open a gap until you do something dramatic. No. No. OK, very good question. This is only nearest neighbor. Now, when you include next nearest neighbor, now you see we have electron hole symmetry. What happens if you include next nearest neighbors, you're going to break the electron hole symmetry, not open a gap. Next nearest neighbor doesn't do anything to the symmetries. So you in introduce next nearest neighbor, you're going to get, instead of it being beautiful and symmetric, this is going to be a little shallower than this. But Really, qualitatively, nothing new happens. Uh, OK, so some uh, nomenclature. So um, at charge neutrality, the Fermi energy sits exactly at the Dirac points. Um, in the 
upper band is called, you have conduction electrons, the lower bands we have valence, is the valence band. So conduction and valence band, as usual with semiconductor, it's just that there's no gap. Okay, a little bit more um, of, of formalism, and don't get too hung up on it. Uh, there's a few points that I would like to make. Uh, so first of all, we go near the K points, and we do a linear expansion. So the, K, the two K points here are psi. Um, psi is an index. These are called valleys. Um, so the psi is an index for valley, so plus one for k, minus one for minus k, and they're the position of four pi over three a and zero on the two sides here, right? Uh, if you expand in small, at small momentum term here, um, so, um, so we define k as the momentum relative to this Dirac point, to this, uh, to this k points here. We define little k. Um, and this is the, by how much we deviate from, from this point. So we deviate a little bit around here, so we get what we, called, uh, what we will now call the momentum relative to the Dirac points. Uh, so these are the momentum operator here. Um, now I'm doing the linear ex expansion for this phase here, and the Hamiltonian, so if you put in these, uh, these approximations here, you get an approximate Hamiltonian that looks like this. And the prefactor here, Vf, which is, we call the Fermi energy, is proportional to the overlap integral times the lattice spacing with some factors here. And this number here is about 10 to the 6 meters per second. It's a velocity. It's a velocity of the quasi-particle, as you see in a moment. But it is about 300 times smaller, for example, than the speed of light. You will see in a moment why I'm mentioning that. Um, OK, so this is the Hamiltonian when you have close to the Dirac point. Uh, it has this form here. So it'll have a plus here in the K point and the minus in the, in the, in the K prime point. And uh, so this is exactly a Dirac-like equation uh, with the uh, eigenstates uh, are the projection of the wave function on sublattice A, sublattice B. So this is, again, our Hamiltonian as I wrote it before. In shorthand notation, I can replace, I can write Px times sigma x, right, uh, and Py times sigma y. So I can write it in a shorthand notation where the sigmas are the uh, Pauli matrices. Okay, so I can write it in terms of Pauli matrix. So I have a very nice compact notation. So the bottom line, the Hamiltonian is equal to the Fermi velocity times the uh, projection of the momentum on this pseudo spin. Sigma is a Pauli matrix, but remember, it operates on the pseudo, on the sublattice degree of freedom, not on spin. We haven't talked about spin at all here. So, so this is the Hamiltonian, extremely simple. This is exactly the, the, what we call the Dirac Bile Hamiltonian, which is for ultra relativistic particles that are massless. Same Hamiltonian as for neutrinos, except that this is in two dimensions. Um, and except VF here replaces the speed of light. For neutrinos, you're going to have speed of light instead of VF. Um, <coughs> OK. so. Pauli matrices operate on the sublattice degree of freedom. So if we, if we take into account the K points and the, the two K points, then instead of having a two uh, component wave function, we have a four component wave function. Uh, and we can just, the Hamiltonian breaks down into two blocks, one for K and the other for K prime. What's important to notice, and this is very, very important, is that Hamiltonian for the K uh, point is VF sigma dot P, whereas for K prime, it's VF sigma star dot P. This is the time reversal brother of the K. So the physics in the K prime valley is time reversal uh, brother of the physics in K. So whatever, if, if, it, if you go like this in the K valley, the electron in the K prime valley is going the other way, OK? So these are related by time inverse, inversion symmetry. Uh, now, the third point that I want to make 
uh, is uh, you know, we can solve for the Hamiltonian very easy. It's a two by two Hamiltonian. You can solve for the energy spectrum and you can solve for the wave function. And the energy spectrum is extremely simple. It's Vf times P or, um, or you can write it as H bar K. Um, and uh, S here is a band index. So it's gonna be positive in the uh, electron in the top band and S is negative in the bottom band here. And the wave function looks like it. Again, S, it changes side for electrons and for holes. So you have, this is a plane wave multiplied by a spinner. Now phi here is the polar angle. It's, it's just the ratio, the arctangents of PY over PX. It's the polar angle. So what we see here immediately, this dispersion is no longer P squared over 2M. It's actually VF times P. This is exactly the dispersion that we have for photons. Uh, exactly the dispersion that we think we have for neutrinos. These are massless particles, mass is zero, and the dispersion is linear in momentum, not quadratic, very important. Uh, so it is like photons, except these are very slow ones. They move 300 times slower than photons or neutrinos. <clears throat> Uh, now, this uh, uh, two-component VEG spinner, it's, as, I, as we said before, it's a pseudo-spin vector. And notice, phi appears here. This is the polar vector. In the, when S is plus one, uh, the pseudo-spin is parallel to, uh, to the momentum, right? We have e to the i phi one here. When S is negative, it's anti-parallel to the momentum, okay? And you're gonna see in a moment what that means. <clears throat> uh, and number four, absence of backscattering within a Dirac cone. So this is our wave vector. If you take, a, 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 if you take the projection of the wave vector in direction zero, so this is basically the angular scattering prob probability, angular scattering probability around a circle, you take the projection of psi at, at angle zero onto projection of psi at angle phi. The square of that is cosine square phi over two. What you see immediately that it's zero. There's absolutely no backscattering uh, at uh, when phi is equal zero. So under pseudospin conservation, that's what this means, backsc backscattering with one valley is suppressed. There's no backscattering with one valley. So an electron that moves in one part of the, K of, of the cone cannot scatter back to the other part of the cone. No backscattering within a valley. This is very important for transport properties. Uh, and number five is the helicity. So we've seen the Hamiltonian can be written like this, sigma dot p. Now you can pull out the actually the magnitude of the momentum. This is sigma dot n. This is known as the helicity operator. Is the projection of the spin onto the direction of the momentum. Uh, it's called helicity when the mass is zero. It's called chirality when you have a finite mass. So you see that this is a good quantum number. So the projection of the pseudospin on the uh, direction of, on the momentum or on K is a good quantum number. It cannot change. So helicity is a conserved quantity and we can have in conduction band, the helicity is plus one. So it goes, let's say clockwise in the, in the, uh, uh, valence band, it's minus one. They go the other way. <clears throat> oh, and here is an illustration of that. So in conduction band, P and pseudospin are parallel to each other. In the uh, valence band, they're anti-parallel to each other. Now, in the other cone, everything is reversed because of the time reversal symmetry. So if you have, if, because helicity is conserved in the other cone, everything is opposite, we have no backscattering between cones. So what does this all mean? Uh, so here, here are the two cones. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian in, the, at, in this K, and this is the, the time-reversed Hamiltonian in this K point. Conserved helicity 
And you see one, we have plus helicity in the K cone, minus helicity in the K prime cone. Would this mean that there is no backscattering between the two? Uh, but we also cannot backscatter because, of, uh, because you cannot backscatter within one cone. We just did that. So the bottom line, it's no backscattering, which means you send an electron in your sample, it can't go back. Uh, it just, um, that means that you're gonna have, you can have very large mobilities, yes? Why is there what? Oh, it's a good quantum number. The Hamiltonian is helicity, okay? So if, a, if an operator commutes with your Hamiltonian, that means that you have a common basis, right, vector, and that means that the corresponding uh, uh, observable is, uh, is conserved, unless you disturb it somehow. Okay. Uh, so this brings us to, uh, to Klein tunneling. Now, when you have, now here I have a barrier or that you can do an electrostatic barrier. I have an electro, this is graphene and I'm applying a voltage here, okay? So it causes a barrier. Now, one thing that maybe I didn't emphasize is that the Dirac point rides on top of the external potential. So the external potential here is this, is flat here, so Dirac point is here. Here, the Dirac, the, I apply a voltage, so the Dirac point is here. Now, notice what's going on. So I, I bring, this is the Fermi energy. I'm bringing an electron, this Fermi, it's moving to the right, that means that it's moving on this branch here. It's moving to the right. Uh, now it's coming under the barrier. Now it's no longer an electron, it's a hole. There's lots of places for it. So it, it's not, there's no back, it can't go, it doesn't have to go back, but it also cannot go back because there's no backscattering. It just cannot, so it has to go through. So it has to go through the barrier. It does that by turning into a hole, and then it comes out again. So it's as if this thing completely didn't exist. Okay, it's completely transparent. So this is, I tried to do this little animation. Hole, electron. It's completely insensitive to electrostatic barriers. This is called Klein tunneling. It used to be called the Klein paradox. How come these massless chiral particles can just go through barriers? But it's not a paradox. It's, it's this. It has to do with, uh, with having ba basically the conduction and, and valence band touching. So what are, the, what are the consequences? We cannot have electrostatic confinement. We cannot use electrostatic to do anything to the electrons in graphene. They do whatever they want. Can't, can't control them with electric fields. So you can't do all the things that we know and love, like make quantum dots, like switch, make transistors. Uh, you can't guide them, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, uh, I told you that there's no backscattering, but that you could have side scattering. Uh, and the, the sides, so now this is transmission probability as a function of angle of incidence, so zero, at, if you, if you come in head on, the transmission is, is absolutely one, but if you go to, at one angle, then it'll depend. You have regions where there is almost no transmission, and the, the red and green depend on the, depend on the energy, on the density of your carriers. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to come to the last point, and that is the Berry phase. Um, so this was, this is a paper by Barry in, the, in 1984. So if you have a Hamiltonian uh, and you very slowly change something, and you, you're sitting in eigenstate and very slowly changing, there's the adiabatic approximation that tells you that the wave, the wave function is gonna follow, is always gonna be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So you take your Hamiltonian through some sort of a circle, you come back to the same point, the Hamiltonian is the same, the wave function will have changed by a phase. And people knew that forever, since quantum mechanics was invented. But people said, okay, phases don't matter in quantum mechanics, let's forget about it. What Barry showed is that this phase carries the information about the trajectory that you went on. And, that, and phases can be seen in quantum mechanics when you have interference effect. So it's not completely invisible. So this is what Barry said. 
And he showed uh, an, an example how to calculate the berry phase by how much does your phase change of the wave function change when you come back, when the Hamiltonians come back to the same spot. So you go along a circle. You have a parameter, lambda equals zero, it, it, at that your wave function depends on. You go on a circle. Uh, and you come to lambda equals one, so you, you increment it continuously, and when you come, you end the circle at lambda equals to one, and then you calculate the very phase like this, it's the imaginary part of the integral over on this loop of, you integrate over lambda, u lambda, d by d lambda, you take the derivative of your wave function with respect to lambda. And I'm gonna show you that if you do this exercise with the wave function for graph, ah, this is pretty neat. So what does the Berry phase mean? Um, the f when the phase of your, your wave function changes, that means that something in the geometry, it, it, it measures something in the geometry of, or topology of your, um, of your environment, of space. So there are many, many examples. Like take, for example, a Mobius bend. Of course, there's a, the topology is not simple. And if you follow G, for example, I'm going around, GG is out here, I'm not seeing it, but, and then it's going here, and then it's gonna appear again. I have to go twice around the circle for G to show up, okay? And that, that tw going twice around the, set, on the circle tells me something about topology of space. Uh, another very nice example is parallel, uh, the parallel transport. Let's say that you have a car, uh, and with a little handle, pointing sideways, and you're going along a geodesic, so I'm coming down here, my car is pointing this way, I'm doing parallel transport. So now I'm going to move parallel to myself, and then I'm going parallel to myself like this. You see it's always pointing the same direction, the, the car knows, it's a weird car. And I'm coming back to the exact same point, but now the nose is pointing in different direction. This is the Berry phase and it measured the curvature of the space. On flat space, you'd get zero. It comes back to exact space, but this is a way to measure the curvature of your space. Um, there's another way which is called, uh, you, in optical fiber, this is a very neat thing. You send a polarized light in optical fiber, you twist the fiber around, the polarization is gonna change, direction is gonna change. And uh, the Dirac belt is amazing, but uh, I don't have time to do it. Uh, I, can, uh, uh, you, I can illustrate it with my hand, but I'm not always successful. In, in the break, maybe I'll show you. Here, <laughs> you know what that is. Uh, okay, so if you do this thing for the wave function in graphene, it's very, pretty straightforward. Uh, you just do this integral, you define lambda as uh, two pi uh, theta, uh, uh, theta over two pi, and you take lambda from zero, from zero to one, you take this integral, you end up with pi. So the very phase of graphene for, electro, for the quasi-particle in graphene is pi. And that has to do with the singularity at the Dirac point. It's measure the, the topology of space. We have a singularity at the Dirac point. This is what it measures. And as a result, it has all sorts of weird consequences, which are seen in quantum Hall effect and, and in Landau levels. Okay. Okay, if you want, you can do this as a homework exercise. Um, okay, so I think I'm pretty much done with my time, right? For the first part. I, I have three more minutes. Okay, I, if I do three more minutes here, I'm, or, or if you're tired, we can do it after the break. Uh, let's do it after the break.